Welcome, investigator. Evil is on the rise. Crime is escalating. Our mission is to eliminate the crime by exposing evil, examine why it manifests, and highlight the brave souls that confront it every day. Join us as we work together to bring justice to every victim. Welcome to All Things Crime. Here's your host, Jared Bradley. Hey, everybody. It's Jared. Welcome to another episode of All Things Crime. Man, we got a treat for you this morning. We got two guests. We got Tom Myers, who's been a, with us a number of times. We also got Joe Kennedy. And if, you're, if you've been a fan of the, of the show for, I'm trying to think of the last time you were on, Joe. It had to have been at least two years ago. Uh, but Joe Kennedy, he is formerly with NCIS. He's a cold case and a homicide detective extraordinaire. Actually started the, the cold case homicide unit in the NCIS. So Joe and uh, Tom, welcome back to the show. All right. Good to be here, Jared. Thanks for having us back. Yeah, Joe. So, you know, you being the guest of honor here, you know, Tom's just one of those ranger guys I drag along everywhere. So, Joe, why don't you why don't you remind everybody, you know, kind of your background, how you got started, and maybe even introduce your book and, and how that came about. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Jared. I'll, I'll just try to go through this kind of quickly. I, uh, you know, spent the majority of my career with NCIS in the mid nineties. We had some cold cases that we started taking a look at, had a little bit of success. And from that, uh, the director kind of tapped me to, to be the team leader for our cold case homicide unit. So we formally, you know, the first case we saw as an agency was in, we basically went down to the Virgin Islands from January 95 till March and were able to get the case over the hump. It wasn't an extremely old case. It was only about a two-year-old case. But from there, I was tasked to, hey, let's set up a squad and then how do we do this? So I immediately went out to about 15 different departments throughout the United States, came back to my state of North Carolina, our State Bureau of Investigation had previously had a cold case unit. Went to Florida where I hooked up with Dave Rivers. Uh, and most people know Dave as having been one of the early pioneers of cold case squads. And then into Boston with Tim Murray, Steve, Steve Murphy, you know, and all, all around the country to, of who was doing it. And what I realized was nobody really had a, a methodology and protocols. A lot of people doing cold cases, but, you know, they didn't, didn't have it written down anywhere. So I just took from those 15 different departments and folks, right, other detectives of what worked for them came back, developed a methodology and protocol for us. And then uh, we created a squad and, and that squad, I think has been fairly successful. And then from there kind of went around the world, helping people set up cold case squads, whether it was in Asia, Europe, uh, Central South Latin America. And, uh, and then I retired 2014, 2016, we started the Carolinas cold case coalition here in North Carolina. A lot of retired local state and federal officers, we just help police departments. It started out just in North South Carolina, but it's expanded now throughout the country. Uh, we're even looking at some cases overseas. And we don't try to tell folks how to do it, right? We just say, hey, we're looking at the case. These are maybe some suggestions we would make. And so that's kind of my, my foray into cold case. When you ask about the book, you know, I had for a number of years wrote down things of, you know, how do you work a cold case? What works? What doesn't work? How do we save time, right? How do we save energy? Because as you know, manpower and resources are so hard to come by in law enforcement that many departments wouldn't even allow people to work cold cases, right? And, and that's still true today, but, you know, based on the limited resources. So I had, you know, kept some good notes and, and put together what I would say was, you know, a working journal. So I was involved in a, a documentary series, a case you worked on, the case I think the MVAC was used on, which was, was Chris Tapp out of, Idaho Falls. And we worked at with Joe Berlanger out of New York, a couple of wrongful convictions where the, the wrong suspect was in jail. So let's go figure out who the right suspect is. And so I was able to help on about six or seven cases with that project. And during the course of that, a, a gentleman by the name of Hogan Hilling, who was lived in Crestline, California, never in law enforcement, had no family members in law enforcement, but was just, I think, enamored with true crime shows. And so he wrote me and he said, hey, uh, I've got some personal things going on in my life. He had a special needs child. He had spent his whole life taken care of. Um, and, you know, he was had written other books. And he said, I, I really enjoyed watching the show and the concept of cold cases. And have you ever thought about writing a book? I said, look, I don't have time to write a book because we're, you know, going all over the world and, and just don't have the time. And he says, well, 
what if I come write the book for you? You tell me, you give me that old manuscript you were working on. Let me piece it together and let me go and get some case samples and I'll reach out to some other folks. So that's what he did. You know, I essentially tried to tag him with some of the experts that I have worked with over the years. You know, whether it was a Colleen Fitzpatrick in California or a Susanna Ryan in California or a Cloyd Stiger right up in, up in the mid, up Northwest, you know, whoever that was. And so I think he did a pretty good job of, you know, getting a, a decent book on cold case. It was designed for two audiences, right? The detective that has no knowledge or experience in cold cases that can pick it up and it gives you an outline or investigative roadmap. But it's also, I think, appealing to maybe cr true crime enthusiasts or, you know, web sleuths or what have you that, that want to know some of the, you know, components of working cold case without us revealing, you know, intricate tradecraft as to how we solve cases. So that's kind of it in a, in a nutshell. And I just want to say this, you know, your, your other guest here, Tom Myers, and Tom's been with you. He and I, before you went on the air here, just had a little chat. And man, he is so right. It is. I, I love it. He said meat eaters, right? Because is there any ham on that bone? That's what we're looking for in a lot of cold cases. And, and he is so correct. You know, there's only, when you look across the country, there's probably, and I think he's his, I think his number is very accurate, hundred, couple hundred people, you know, that, that what we're, a true meat eaters, right. That are dedicated, that live, still live and breathe this stuff, even though we're retired, you know, our day in the sun is over officially, but we just can't let it go. And so uh, I applaud you. I know uh, Tom has been with you. I don't think you could have gotten anybody better to promote your MVAC because it sure sounds like a little bit of research I did on him. He's got some great depth to him. And he's been in a lot of different places with the FBI, you know, and, and I think that, you know, he, he's given you a great optic and not just for you and your, you know, your company, but for, for all of the consumers of the MVAC, when they come to you, you know, you got to have the knowledge of, of how crime works, right. To really be able to effectively use. We got to be careful though here, Joe, because um, Tom, Tom will get a big head here. Well, we can let the air out of him. No problem, Jared. <laughs> so I, I was with the FBI. I'm used to being kicked in the face, you know, so uh, <laughs> yeah, we, can, no. we can walk that one back. Thank, thanks for the nice accolades. I feel the same way about you, Joe. Meat eaters and forensic savages, people who you, you have a conversation with them and they just know it right out the gate. And you're like, we're off and running. You said Cloyd before. He's uh, on board on something. We're working mutually. And it's just like, what a pleasure. And, you know, like conversations like this, what a pleasure because you, you just like minded people who are out there killing it. You know, just how can I contribute more? How, you know, I don't want you to contribute more to the team effort. And, um, yeah, it's a, it's, you're not working anymore. Yeah. I, have a, I have a quote I used to throw out there. It's from DeShiel Hammett, the, the Continental Op. And he says, I'm going to paraphrase here, but he says, I don't want to do anything else. He said, sure. And even back then, he said, I can make another. 20,000, I think is what he says. And I'm going to send it to you guys afterwards and we should inject it in the show. But he says, I don't want to know anything else. This is what, what makes me happy and, um, and doing what you enjoy. He goes, don't have anything against money. It's good stuff, but doing what you want to do. And, uh, you can't weigh any sum against that. And I'm paraphrasing that, but yeah, exactly right. And, uh, how, uh, what, what a better, you're truly, truly making a, an imprint on society. You're making a difference. You're giving victims back a piece of that. And the whole community kind of heals when you solve one of these things or at least exhaust these things. Uh, and as long as I got my hand on the throttle, I'll continue here. Yeah, I worked something, uh, actually a, um, a guy I knew from the army and we dug on that a little bit and got some luck and somebody jumped into the middle of it. And you're talking about mm, not quite Hatfield and McCoy's, but there were a lot of tense moments about who did this rape homicide and it ultimately resolved itself. But you talk about decades of like somebody gets enough drinks in them, they're possibly going to go out and kill the wrong person. And now you got a compounded community problem and it's resolved. It's resolved and there's healing that goes on. So yeah, I'm glad to be part of any of the efforts. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Before we get too far along now, you know, my, my copy of your book is not supposed to be here till tomorrow. So I'm kind of embarrassed about this, but I, I made a copy of this. This is Joe's book, Solving Cold Cases. So all of you that are out there and you know, it's interesting, Joe, as you were talking, first of all, what, what it, it you almost gave me the impression that, you know, at, it, prior to maybe 1995, cold cases weren't really a focus. Is that, 
not the case or, or is that just kind of, you know, that's when we really started hearing about people working on cold cases. You know, Jared, I mean, you can go back to some of the original history of cold case dates back to the seventies. Right. And ironically, some of the first effective squads was the LA County Sheriff's uh, department, not the LAPD. Right. That's kind of interesting, but they, they kind of trace the, their origins of cold case work back to the mid seventies. And there were people doing it. Don't get me wrong. All through the eighties and through the nineties, I just don't think, you know, you didn't have the advent of the internet information was not, or the information flow was not easy, right? For folks to consume information about crime. And then I don't, you know, there, I think cable television and the internet created this explosion or fascination with true crime. And that has fueled the recent explosion of, I think, cold cases. Now, cold cases have kind of like, you know, up over the years, they've kind of went up and down, right? In terms of the ability for departments to, to dedicate resources to it. You'll notice that, that shortly after 9-11, any, any efforts on cold case, you know, were almost non-existent because, you know, the, the country was enamored. I'm sure Tom remembers it was enamored with chasing terrorists. Right. And that's what everybody did. You know, now any cold case work like our my old agency at NCIS, our cold case focus was, you know, old war crimes or, or murders in a war zone, you know, from that had not been uh, or a terrorist act like. Maybe the Macheteros down in uh, Puerto Rico or, uh, you know, some of the bombings uh, at, at embassies of military members, you know, that were attaches or assigned to an embassy in foreign countries. But um, there's an explosion today with cold cases. And it's and it's interesting what the dynamic, because most of today's cold case work is centered around what you're doing with the MVAC. Right. And, and of course, the, the, the come along to that or the follow along to the MVAC is investigative genetic genealogy or forensic investigate, you know, FIG, whatever, IgG, whatever people want to call it today. They're different. Depending on who you're with, they put a different little, little rhyme to it. But, you know, we didn't have that until really, I mean, we had it before Golden State, but, it, you know, if you go back to the canal killings in Phoenix in 2015, Colin Fitzpatrick yeah. worked on that. And that was really the first big case where investigative ge genetic genealogy was tagged but it didn't catch any steam, right? It, 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 what the theory or the, the concept was not ripe. And so it didn't, you know, it didn't gain a lot of traction until Golden State. And then since then, you know, because used to how we solve cold cases is, yes, you would go into an evidence locker, find this piece of evidence, you know, from 20 years ago that had not been re-examined by our lab or maybe some new technology is used to where we find it. But, you know, there was a lot more, cold cases solved through interviews, right? And interrogations. Mm -hmm. And and if, first, if people having to carry that burden for so many years of having killed someone to where you get skilled interviewers and interrogators working against them to elicit, you know, a confession. But that all changed with Golden State. And so you'll see the, the primary focus today is more technological based, right? Like what you're doing with the MVAC. What still blows my mind is how few MVACs are out there. Because as I travel around the country, it's almost daily where I see a garment, right? And I think it works best on clothing. If I understand correctly, the technology may correct me on that. But I think the best, you know, I see a lot of cases where the suspect was grabbed, the suspect was, you know, there's no doubt, you know, when you just look at the old scene photos, oh my gosh, that, that suspect totally, you know, ripped those clothes off of that yeah. victim. Or you can clearly see they went into the victim's pockets or... So, you know, when I when we talk about the optic, I think, and not to sound negative, but I think we're in such a fast-paced world now that detectives are first leaning to technology, which is good, right? What I think yeah. we're, we, we need to get back to a little bit is, okay, in working parallel is very strategic interviews of key witnesses, very calculated interrogations and, you know, one of the things that's worked so well for me over the years, it's in the book. Uh, I have a colleague here uh, that just retired from the Raleigh Police Department, Jerry Falk. He has worked for him as well, is doing interrogations in non-traditional locations, right? I.e. not the police station. So sometimes that's the suspect's house. That's a city park. You know, that is in some very, you know, a, a low-end hotel in the community. So, you know, there's different philosophies on how to work cold cases, Jared. I don't, I don't mean to ramble on here with you, but to me, I think this is a great time for 
for your product, you know, that MVAC, I'm just baffled of how few people are embracing, you know, because everywhere I go, you know, even in some cases, let's say a 40 year old case, they, they worked it 20 years ago. Right. Right. And then now they've re-inherited the case another 20 years later. So another set of detectives, it's already been looked at as a cold case, but now they're looking at it and I'm thinking, Oh my gosh, we should impact this. Right. This is certainly something that we would want to impact, but, I mean, to me, I think the future of law enforcement is investigative genetic genealogy. And, and my problem with right now, from a legislative standpoint, is no one, everybody's worried about privacy, okay? I think that's just crazy. Let's get rid of this privacy concerns. Let's use this stuff to solve crime, not just cold cases, but hot homicides. Can you imagine if we used investigative gen genetic genealogy on hot cases, right? It would solve how many, it's countless, right? And I think, you know, from my standpoint, also in labs, most crime labs, people are going to get upset when I say this, but they're not trying to solve cases. Let's use your impact for an example. Certain labs here in the South, you know, like in my state of North Carolina, you can only send 10 pieces of evidence to the forensic lab to start with. That's crazy. South Carolina, five pieces, right? And, and so they examine them and then they say, okay, we didn't find anything, so send some... You know, 30 years ago, and Tom knows this, you send everything from your crime scene, right? And they process everything. Mm -hmm. And that's everything. just not happening today. So, yeah. you know, there's a couple of obstacles, and that's where I think items like your MVAC are, you know, just so valuable because uh, that's what we need to solve these cases. You know, and, and that's what's solving the majority of today's cases is technology, as opposed to some of the old gumshoe detective work interviews, interrogations, you know, and circling the wagons back, that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. A, a, a little commentary on that. So working it from a different vein and coming out of this about three and a half years retirement. And then I was very blessed at the end of my career as they would let me run amok with the evidence response team. And I, I was had an incredible team. They were just very hungry. And we would go out and take these old cases and companion cases with the PDs and start tearing a, them apart forensically. So the phenomena, as I saw, with the with this kind of this anti police sort of mindset and this lessening of um of immunity over here, the the police are somewhat afraid. The detectives are afraid, so they rely on technology. So it goes into the lab and they wait passively for that to come back out, and they're afraid to get in somebody's face and stomp on them. And you know, it, the, there's mistakes made. I mean, Chris Tapp made a confession, uh, you know, exoneration, great exoneration that happened over here, but ultimately. He confessed. Now, we can argue all day about wh what happened on the confession, how long they, they leaned on him and, and what they're going to allow us. That's a court decision and everything else. But in that same vein, you know, like you said, you have to have those people and have to have those strategic interviews. But over time, and let me inject this, I, I tell them, everybody who comes to me and I talk to the forensic types mostly, and I do a little bit of training for them as well to prep for that, that IAI certification test, which is brutal. I put it somewhere being beneath like maybe paramedic, but certainly above that hundred, hundred some odd hour EMS. That's the level of expertise there. And, and literally, if you're not working forensics, it would be, you would be really hard pressed to pass that test because it's so complex. So I said, you guys are the ambassadors. You have got to take and give that information delivered to the detectives because they're the guys who come from the ranks and they're on par with the chiefs. It's not going to come through the forensic people, but you've got to take that and transmit it for usable information to them so they understand that sitting in the in the um, evidence locker is could be very good information that can solve that. And if you sit passively and wait for a detective to tell you, they're not going to have the knowledge that you have about bloodstain patterns, about uh, certainly DNA. I mean, we could go all day long. I said, additionally, if you go pre- 1970s the law really didn't allow for retention of a lot of this stuff court records right. yes but some it gets lost man so get past that if it's gone it's gone and if you had a possible out there you're going to get and i think joe if, when i eventually read your book people's al allegiance and alliances changes sides especially former girlfriends and ex-spouses because they're either terrified right and get them out of there and get them talking and what i found with a lot of them is there's just like, well, the police wanted to come talk to me. They knew where I was at all these years. And I have to explain to 
some folks in out in LA and the film producers, I said, there is not a murder board behind you like Homicide Life on the Street where they have it and they're reviewing. And they go, how, how about this one from 1978? Doesn't exist. Forget it. They don't even know it happened. And, and Joe, we're old enough to remember you had to log long distance phone calls um, yeah. when we came on. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, you how, how good are you could possibly going to be? You know, so get past that, tear that evidence bin open, look who's changed sides or who was potentially it. And another, you know, I'm, I, as long as I got my hand on the throttle again, I called an agent uh, on a pretty, pretty, pretty prominent case. He's 85 years old, made his year to call him about it. I said, and there was no success to it. I said, did you ever have an inkling of who did it? He said, unfortunately, no, but I remember it like yesterday. But if he said we knew it was the blank, the boyfriend, the ex-husband or something, we just couldn't put it down. Man, that supercharges it. And you just go get that DNA and you're on your way. So, so many of these things are just low hanging fruit. Um, like you said, just roll it out. Yeah. You can tell I got a bit of a passion for this as well. So, um, yeah, we, and, and other people will bring back things to the equation or our gumbo, right? Our cold case gumbo. And soon you're like, oh yeah, we corroborated that example. Uh, before I shut up here, I'm going to bet you. So the Lindsay Wade e example is like getting Ted Bundy's DNA into mm -hmm. CODIS. Yes. You're kidding me, right? But I'm sitting here saying we had John Brennan Crutchley right near here, the vampire rapist, and Christopher Wilder came through here. He actually murdered a classmate of my my wife's from this area right here. And then down in South Florida, I knew somebody who was who was murdered by him as well. Small world, right? Um, but just those two alone, I think he was Tallahassee where I went to school. All those connections, probably not in CODIS at all. You know, I mean, his ex, he died in a gun battle, but Brennan Crutchley died in prison, so I'll bet you his DNA is not out there. And you're talking about that's probably low hanging fruit clearances alone right there. And we're, you know, arguing over lab budgets and stuff. It's absurd. So right there with you. Yeah. And, and turn it back over. Yeah, no. And, and I, I'll tell you, you know, the, when we put together or when I, our group at NCIS, we put together a checklist, right? So the first thing is get the case organized, right? Have you got everything that exists? And the very second thing, step is to go to the evidence locker, go to the property room, and is the evidence there, right? And not only go there and believe the documentation that you have in the file, whether that be evidence custody documents yeah, yeah. or a chain of custody or whatever, but physically review it, right? And what does that look like? Oh, wow. And now, because we, you know, is it still in the box? Because you're, as you alluded to earlier, some of these old cases shoot there you know evidence is lost evidence is destroyed evidence you know perishes in a fire at a sheriff's department i mean there's a, a hundred reasons but i agree with you and I, and I think what surprises me so much tom is you know having been intimately you know on the start of a cold case unit in 95 and to look you know 30 some years later now that we are still walking through evidence lockers looking for the old evidence and i'm like you it's low-hanging fruit it's like oh my gosh and then, you know, DNA has gotten a lot better. I mean, let's, if you go back to some of the original DNA in, that we use in this country, RFLP, that never got into CODIS, right? That extraction and amplification method was never even in CODIS. And if you think about CODIS went online about 98, I remember working with Jennifer Lindsay at your lab at the FBI, you know, think of all, some of those people are now being released, right? For murders, you know, convicted in mid late nineties. Now they're out and people are going, why is this DNA not? Well, maybe it was a convicted, maybe it was an arrestee state, convicted offender state. It never, it never got uploaded. But I will say this, you know, I think, I do think IgG is the future of cold case. Um, a lot of people, you know, have that feeling as well. I think that's where it's going. And, and, and to your point, technology, you know, is, is really the game changer today. And you, you said it, not me. So I just want to jump on it. There, this defund the police movement, this, you know, officers are very risk averse, right? Detectives are more risk averse because of things that, that you could do years ago is, is prohibited today, right? And, and the, the, the feeling of, of detectives in general is not what it used to be in terms of just bystander behavior. On a hot homicide today, you know, folks won't even open their door for a neighborhood canvas, you know, and so you've got yeah. to rely on some of these, some of these things, but the book talks about, you know, what, what in technology, you know, what I think is, you know, for some detectives is just, which comes secondhand to you, Tom, you pick up a lab report here, you see it's a partial profile, primary contributor, right? Mixed stain, 
these things jump out right at you. And I applaud you for encouraging all those CSIs, right? And those forensic folks, whether they're, you know, from a, from a, you know, an official capacity or not, because that's one of the challenges right now with the detectives working the case is they don't have that thorough forensic background, even in simple things like bloodstain pattern analysis, like you said. So it's a critical part, right? The, the folks doing the crime scenes for sure. And the follow-up forensics. And then depending on where you're at in the country, you know, criminalistics is much better on, you know, say in California than it is here in North Carolina. Uh, some CSI units in the South, it's more of a collateral duty. Many of those positions are non-sworn, right? So they don't have the status or the stature in their departments as the sworn personnel. And I'm always encouraging the detectives, look, you have to trust the crime scene. Oh, you awesome. have to trust, trust the people because they have knowledge you don't have. I mean, we have one of our departments here in North Carolina. It's the city of Durham extremely well-qualified crime scene techs, most of them. And most of these young guys and gals, have, or they have advanced forensic degrees, whether it's George Washington University or another forensics program. And so they're bringing right out of the gate, you know, they might only be 22 or 23 years old of age, but man, they have great depth with, you know, how forensics work and, you know, that, that some of your just your common detectives don't have that knowledge. That same kind of mindset, what we're talking about is that you're detaining somebody on the scene. And I, I use the example of bloodstain pattern and I'm going, well, why are you letting this guy go? I mean, if there's a void where blood should be, that's the easy one. But even, even just a, a, a li and the, and if you get IAI certified, you'll know a bit of bloodstain pattern. I mean, the scene should make sense to you. So getting those detectives to mesh up with it and then they rely on the lab. And it just, uh, it's an unfortunate thing is the, the, the passivity. It's hard to get people into detective bureaus because they don't want to get sued. They really don't want to deal with it. And why would you do? And so some of the contacts I have, I talked to them. I said, how, how is it like these days? And they're like, well, we're not even doing traffic stops. Why? I don't want to complain against me because I'm going to be you know, tied up with that and everything else. And I'm going, OK, we got to get back to that. I mean, I know it's cyclical, pretty, you know, predates me a little bit, but 68, I, I, I what I've read about was very passive and things changed again. And I think things are going to change again. There's got to be some kind of exemption for the police to do that. But I do think that a checklist on how to work through this is going to be very helpful, a, a roadmap. And they use that, by the way, in bloodstain pattern, create as a roadmap of what this stain is and everything else. So it can't be that far away from it. You know, it's if we can get <laughs> politics removed from it, we might move someplace. But in the meantime, this ad hoc uh, using these these good tools for us and getting those technicians to become to become apostles of carrying that message that that message forward. Example, as long as I'm rambling on here, <laughs> is we had a school shooting and it, it was handled well. It was in the middle of a blizzard. We responded down to it, and the whole government and everything was closed. And here we are moving through the snow, and this unfortunate school shooting took place. And afterwards, I was, I was able to get a Pharaoh scanner after that. That changed things. But we need other crime scene units because we don't scan the scene. We're just degrading that scene. We're not getting stuff. We're not sitting. We're sitting on evidence. And it was a very slow process. So we borrowed something from the military. We had some guys, ComCam, the um, combat cameramen, come over and, and do some work with us. Well, they do very effective, sensitive site exploitation. They know what it means and this is jared and us from ranger school you don't sit on intelligence which is kind of lost to the police department now the detectives do that really well but a but a 24-hour turnaround on something you could do it right then you know and the good detectives do they're looking right at the casing and seeing the imprint Im, impact mark from the primer and they know they're looking at you know they're looking at it a glock right away the good ones will but we could do a better job at that, you know, to get that turnaround because it's sitting in there. That's something we borrowed from them. And I think that's, that's something we can do better at. We can do better at. And the way we carry that message forward is by those forensic pros. Because like you said, they're so good. They're coming out with master's degrees from, from those, the universities. And they can literally use, they, they're literally using the same books for the IAI certification. So they practically have it memorized when they come to the the, the test prep on this, I'm astounded how good they are compared to when I uh, went up to the Baltimore, D.C. area, and they're, they're fantastically well-trained. So my point about that, if I can summarize it, was I had a talk with the boss, and I said, sir, ma'am, I cannot sit back passively when we have an active shooter and 
then decisions are being made as this is a, an evolving crime scene. I can remember the, it was a pretty, uh, it was a prison takeover and they were brutalizing these guards. Well, if I had been there and I explained this to him, I had been there. I could have told you what we need is evidence over there. I just, I don't need another responsibility or a title or anything like that, but I need to be in your back pocket and, and advising that. So we can get to these forensic types and they become forensic advisors as that case progresses you're going to make a good inroad to do it. And I, I, I'm thinking of Montgomery County did a great job on, on that. One of the, I'm, I'm speaking to the Lion sisters uh, case out of there. Mm-hmm. And they had them right involved with that. It was very impressive. And, and what a difference when you see that happen. So I think we're getting to that. That's the way we're going to offset that passivity. That's, that's well-deserved from, because this is such a cautious environment right now. So if we can speed up the forensics, I think we can offset and mitigate that, that deleterious effect that's coming from them, their inability to go out and interview people. But if you're making good, solid decisions, I think you can offset that quite a bit. And, and then it builds confidence and everybody's relying on those good forensic processes and what they see. You can't, you can't refute blood pattern spatter. You can't refute trajectory analysis on, on a car. You know, and when the faster you move that along and the faster you make that unlab uh what's uh unscientific then then you're moving very very quick i guess that 48 hour period you know the first 48 right hey joe one one of the things that we're doing here at least with some of our training i'm also involved with a group where we do some of the advanced training in north carolina and simple dow rods that you buy at a home depot right and for trajectory analysis you've seen this yeah right the the cars you know it's a drive by there's five shots in the car Hey, and, and you got witnesses telling you they were at a certain place, just sticking a dow rod in the and the bullet hole gives you the, right. you know, just yeah. a little bit of an idea from a detective standpoint. But one thing I think you might find interesting is that our coalition, we have a number of crime scene techs involved with our group. So they don't have any sworn right experience. It's all just from processing scenes. And, you know, as you know, they can look at a scene very differently because of their expertise. And we, and that's been very helpful, particularly in the blood stain pattern analysis world, you know, directionality of blood, a, you know, your victim's sitting here, your suspect's here. It looks like he was hit four times, you know, based on the impact and the cast off. Right. And, and the detective's looking at it like, what is this? And, but they're able to at least bring that, you know, some of those thought process to the table. So I just wanted you to be aware of that. I don't know yeah. if, if you've seen that in other areas or, or not. Oh my gosh. Yeah. You know what I see it, it, exactly that, but it's the ingratitude and it's just, it's not right or wrong. It's just that those detectives have a lot of things in their head and they're used to moving along and it's a culturally accepted. And I can say this because I was, you know, a near plank holder at the South Florida, the Broward Forensic Association, the FDII, and I can see the personalities and, and you just get used to them package that up. Give me the bottom line. I'm going to move over to 10 witnesses that are waiting. And if I don't, they'll be scattered to the winds. So there's no disparity I'm throwing on detectives or anything else. But to your point, exactly right. If you could get. So what ends up happening? It comes across as brusque or irreverent and the, they get the technicians become upset or they're just trying to process this or they're not approved for overtime. And then there's angst on their side. And I hear this from them. And I, I, I was very close to it. My mom, like I said, was a non-sworn for years. And it's, those are phenomenons. And you speak to it very adroitly when you say, you know, sworn, because I was the entire time and I worked both sides of it. And I found that to be very rewarding, but there's drawbacks because the more I'm spending on that scene, the less I'm talking to that person who's now talking to their sister or, and that erodes that, that, that witness statements that's there. So how do we mitigate that? I, I, it, it, it's a blessing to have those those folks, um, the CSI folks out here. And I said, it's not easy. And it's not something you had to come over here and, and to get upset about. Like, I can't do my job. You have to just tell them if you involve me a little bit earlier and the good leaders will. And that's where I think we can just really take something that's detrimental right now with the police work and turn that. You have to go through these trials to get to that next level over here. And that's what we're going through right now. So we can really supercharge up the forensics, get that to become near near uh, real time. And if we had a checklist to involve that, you could probably process that out pretty quickly. It, it Like I said before, I don't know of a detective 
I don't, I honestly, anybody who's, who's an investigative role who could pass that IAI course, it's just, uh, the IAI certification. It's very in depth. You're having to do the math on trajectory. You're having to, they can do this and they can pr provide you something. And if we can harness that, well, now everybody's contributing to the cause and they're not acting like the cleanup crew. And, and these come from hearing kind of those, those sort of comment over the years from different from, from different people, just right, disparaging comments like that, uh, like just get it to me. I need to know it, and it's not. It's a team effort, man. It's a it's a race to see who's going to be, you know, to the finish line last and give the most to the equation. And now, man, now we're moving. Now we're moving that ball. We're making points each time, you know. Yeah, and I, and I will say this, you know, and you know this, Tom. People solve murders. Teams solve murders, not individuals. I want to just jump to what you were saying here because this is in the book and I want to highlight it because it's so important. Okay, cool. Right. We, uh, a lot of times the investigators, and I've been guilty of this many times over the years, of trying to make their theory fit the crime. Right. And you'll see that in American law enforcement, we, the, the culture kind of has us doing suspect based investigations, right? Chasing suspects. What we should be doing, and I, I put a lot of emphasis on this in the book, is we should be doing evidence based investigations. Right. What is the evidence telling us, right? Yeah, like if I go to a crime scene and I see that blood spatter and let's say that the girl is, you know, it's blunt force trauma and all the injuries are to the left side of her face, right? And then you see maybe there's a stab wound even on the left side of her shoulder. You know, is our offender right-handed, right? I mean, if it's a frontal attack, I mean, just simple stuff, right? And and again, uh, that's where I think the, the crime scene techs and the forensic experts are a critical piece to the overall teamwork because they sat and look at it from that, that viewpoint, right? What is the evidence telling me happened here? Not what is some witness telling me who the, the best potential suspect is. And again, I, I picked this up. I spent some time in the Netherlands back in 2000 with the, several of their deaf investigators, mostly out of Utrecht, the city of Utrecht, which is uh, I think about an hour and a half from Amsterdam. But they 100% you know, they ignore suspects. They just look at the evidence. What's the evidence telling me? Where are they at? What's the blood spatter telling me? What is the, what is the, is there signs of a struggle? Is it forced entry? Is it, you know, can we determine any remorse in the scene? Can we determine control in the scene? You know, can we control, can we determine anger in the crimes? You know, these kind of things to where instead of chasing a suspect or a name or, you know, and, and, and we got to have to remember, and I, and I highlight this in the book, there's only three things that solve murders, right? Physical evidence, witnesses, and confessions. I mean, if you get down, it's, it's really that simple. And the evidence is, is the, the best gold standard, you know, whether that's DNA or a fingerprint. I mean, those are the two greatest gold standards, you know, followed by other evidentiary items, uh, of course. But, you know, witnesses, you can't always depend on witnesses. They change their story. Their, their credibility gets impeached. They don't show up for trial. You know, and, and so that's why a lot of cases come down. You know, you got to get a confession if you don't have that physical evidence. But what prosecutors want is all three, right? The silver platter. They want a confession. Yeah. They want physical evidence. They want witnesses. And, and what I see happening, too, with a lot of cold cases is there are a lot of risk averse prosecutors, right? It, when you come, when you bring a cold case to them, because in a lot of cold cases, they actually want twice as much evidence. And I, you know, they'll be like, hey, this thing's old. I got to I got to overcome these obstacles. You know, can you get me some more? Can you find some more witnesses? But, you know, a lot of people don't realize. And, I, and, and Jared, I probably said this on the first show. I, and I'll just I'll say this and then I'll, I'll go back to you or, or Tom. But how hard it is to solve a cold case. You know, if you think about the numbers, you know, there's estimates that are anyway, we could have up to three hundred and twenty five thousand cold cases now. If you look at the numbers of solved cases, only about one in five cases do we have a clearly, clearly distinguishable suspect. One of 20 will a prosecutor charge. Only about 100, one in 100 will you actually have a successful prosecution. That's crazy. Now, you'll see those numbers are a little better with IgG, right? As IgG has popped up, but then we also have to remember how little cases have been or how few cases have been have been cleared with IgG. And that's even, with, you know, with Othram storming onto the scene and some of these other groups, you know, we still, you know, that's still on the low numbers of solves when you think about it. So to your point, I think we need to figure out how can we get this evidence examined, evaluated, analyzed much faster. And I think that's what you were kind of saying. Did I, under, did I hear you correctly there? 
Yeah, yeah. You know, and I'll say the other side of the equation, because a lot of the exonerations of the folks are looking through things through a, a different lens. And I got to do a little bit of film work and I would hear about the the bias. You know, example is Chris Tapp. I mean, you know, you got to admit he's a great suspect because of his, his colleague who was with him, who was charged on the sexual battery. OK, so I said, I said, OK, let's let's. Let's not take a political stance on this, folks, but let's look at this. You have, you know, say 10 hours a day, 600 magic minutes. And what do you want to devote those to of those those minutes? Case in point, Black Dahlia, I got a chance to pick at that a little bit. They found a note, if I if I remember correctly, saying Black Dahlia, Elizabeth Short was married. So they figured out who the servicemen or former servicemen, they went on a train across country to go interview him because this is the best suspect out here. Man, that's probably like a two-day trip to go all the way out over to Pennsylvania, if I recall, to go on to, uh, you know, get permission to interview this guy. He goes, look, it was a joke, man. We were trying to make a, f a friend of his jealous. He goes, I'm not married to her at all or anything else. And so you're talking about, okay, return trip, four days are burned up there. That's gone. That is colder than, you know. Shakespeare's grave at that point, but you have to devote resources and you got to decide where to go. So, you know, kind of uh, offsetting that point is like, well, you can't just go, well, let the evidence sit back. I love it because I, Jared, you know what I'm talking about when I say this, let's try to disprove this theory, try to knock it out of the water, why it, why the machine doesn't work. And let's go about it that way rather than run off that way. But, you know, you have to make a choice eventually. Like, it, 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 I, I heard that said, well, isn't it true the captain said, who do you like for this? Well, that's just a colloquialism. Like, who do you like for it? Uh, well, I like this guy. He's got a history of it and everything else. But, I mean, what are you going to do? Like, not use your, your brain on that? And so maybe off, to offset a bit and to explain to people, nobody is trying to set anyone up on this over here. It's just that those detectives live with that scene of that person being opened up like a, a gutted deer and they, they, this is why so many of them crawl into a bottle on so many of them in their life earlier, because this is what they live with. And they're trying to give solutions. This is what they joined for. They didn't join to make money. They joined to make a difference over here. So these are really the true victims on this stuff. So we have to mitigate that, offset that, explain, you know, the personalities and, and the use of words and everything else. So um, I just do explain that as that's the phenomenon out here. Nobody's taking a shortcut. And if you come after those guys they're going to work even slower now and more methodically and plot along. So it's it's just kind of an unfortunate time. But if we can rest those things, explain that, then people kind of go, oh, I never I never knew. I never understood. By the way, I'll say this. Black Dahlia, 47 minutes where they took the fingerprints and they used a crude fax machine that the news service would do, sent them all the way over to Quantico. And in 47 minutes, they had two two uh, cards for Elizabeth Short. Yeah. She had worked in a, in a camp and everything else. So there's, you know, they had her identified post-mortem from the autopsy in 1947. So there's an example of, you, you know, you, it's got to be that synergistic, sort of maybe like cooking a meal for Thanksgiving. You're bringing everything at once sure. in there and you got to pay attention to all those things. But it's not easy and it's not easy. Each one of these things is different. Um, so... You, you know, yeah, I, I, I say that because, uh, but to finish up my, my diatribe here, yeah, you absolutely have to blind yourself to that and not let that theory go along with it because, man, you know, you've, you've devoted so much time, your reputation's on the line, and you're going, I really think this is the guy, and you get to the end of it, and you're like, oh, he was, it's not even him, and, and they go, what happened, Tom? And I'm like, I just, you know, I, I thought it was up to, and then, you know, you're here, here, and here, but, you know, yeah. But you got to try to disprove that. Uh, you got you to knock that one out. But I, I like the New Zealand, I'm sorry, the Netherlands mindset of looking at that things critically because that will force you to blind yourself to it, you know, to come up with that. Hey, with that, with that in mind, good Joe, stuff. When, when, yeah, boy, this is awesome. I've just been kicking back listening to you guys. It's been fantastic. So, Joe, I got a question for you. So, in light of, especially like what you said about the Netherlands, when they're Basically, they, they ignore the suspects and they just mostly focus on the evidence. In light of that, why do you think more detectives don't involve and, and make almost like, an, like a, a partnership with their CSI groups more often? It's like, to me, I, I see as I go around the country and I'm, and I'm working with people, it's like, especially the, the non-sworn that we talked about earlier, there's a lot of detectives that just don't. They just don't look at their, their CSIs. If they're, if they're civilians, they just don't look them as, as equals and, and as professionals. 
and they don't utilize them to the extent that they should. And I think a lot of cases suffer because of that. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I do, Jared. And I think what we're talking about at the very basic level is organizational culture. You know, and through whether it's even whether it's police departments or it's federal law enforcement agencies, you know, state police agencies, what you're going to find is folks that are have the responsibility of just being right. The evidence collectors, because that's what a lot of detectives will view them as. Right. Hey, they're going out and they're collecting the evidence. And I think it it comes down that a lot of detectives, you know, it, it's a status thing, too, in many departments that a lot of folks are distri- striving to become a detective. And they there's just not a lot of in the culture or the organizational culture of law enforcement. You know, for me, where I see it in the southern states is they're non-sworn personnel. You know, hey, you're not even a sworn detective. What do you know? Okay, so you went to the school and you have this advanced degree in forensics. What does that matter? How's that going to help me solve my case? Whereas if they would just collaborate more, they would realize, and that's what we try to, to, to preach at our Cold Case Coalition awesome, is man. Awesome. somebody is going to look at that scene. And I mean, that's why we have three or four crime scene techs that are part of our unit, because they have a whole different view of it. It's just like we have crime analysts that are part of our Cold Case Coalition. And they have a, they're have they looking at things from an analytical view, right? And you have to put all those components together to make a team. But I think it's just the, the, the culture of the organizations that, you know, it's, it's like anything. Let me show you a difference. You know, a lot of we do some advanced training in the state, and, and most of this is homicide training or, or, you know, rape investigation, robbery. And so typically what happens is we'll have a room full of detectives, and there'll be four or five patrol officers there. And I always ask them, hey, introduce yourselves. And we go around the room and they say, well, I'm just in patrol. I'm just a patrol officer. Well, and then what if you're a patrol officer in Durham, North Carolina, where they're we're responding to 60 or 70 homicides a year, right? You have gained a whole lot of valuable experience from, you're not just patrol, right? And I try to reinforce that. Same thing when crime scene techs come, right? Or the, our forensic folks is, they say, well, I'm, I'm just work, I just work CSI. I'm just on the crime. So, I mean, it's almost like yeah. the culture, right? I don't mean to beat this to death, but it's the culture is causing a lot of this. And it's hard for folks to come in and change that culture because, you know, a lot of, you got you got to remember what law enforcement is attracting is a lot of type A personalities, right? It's a lot of folks that, you know, have, have a strong opinion things, you know, they're type A and, and, and they don't want this person who's maybe, you know, not as aggressive that, that has these so-called soft skills, right, of impeding on, on, on what they need done. Tom said it best. Hey, just give it to me now. You know, give, give me what you got and I'll, you know, I got to go interview these eight other witnesses. So I'll take into consideration what you gave me. But it's, so I, I don't know. I probably didn't answer your question, but that's just from my optic what I see. No, it's perfect. same Same it, it, sort of yeah, phenomenon, yeah. Jared. Yeah, I, not to hijack it, but. We did something I, I, I didn't like in the FBI. We would cut leads out to people. So you're working some kind of homicide or something, and I'm sending a lead out to someplace. I'll play, no, I need to be on an airplane and interview this person. Yes. I hated it with a passion because you know those little things. Let me think if I can articulate this well. Well, part Adam of Walsh. it is, is you lose, you lose the, the passion of it. You lose the, the intensity of it, really, because it's not really your case. If you just got... You know, somebody just calls you up and say, hey, go interview this person. You know, you don't have, that's just, that's just human nature there. You just, you lose some of that connectivity with the actual case. You're just like, well, I'm just going to go out and talk to this, this person. You know, I, I, not to, not to run into the fiction part of it, but if you ever see Jason Bourne movies, you know, that one scene where they send that four year department of whatever state department guy to go interview Jason Bourne. And he's just kind of nonchalantly walking into the room and he's like, so, uh, you know, who you, who are you, Jason Bourne? You know, you're going to talk to us whether you like it or not. Next thing you know, he's unconscious laying on the floor and has no idea what's going on. And that's, to me, it's kind of the same type of a scenario that if you're going to lose that much connectivity, then it's worth it to send the original a detective out there who's actually really involved with the case and trying to solve it. Yeah. I, I was starting to say before about the Adam Walsh and I'm glad I had the break Jared there. So Otis tool what became about, the suspect man. on that. Yeah. 
and they and they cleared that. And I, and I have a personal stake in this. My mom had to put that all together at the end of it. And I was a police explorer there in Hollywood all those years. So I was literally as a kid there watching this whole thing evolve, evolve, and a new set of eyes, you know, unsophisticated eyes watching Adam Walsh evolve. So over the years, I've kind of checked on it. Well, they. We're, and we, and there's a, a, a weird anomaly out there in as much as the a, a court decision went out where it said if the case is so dormant that you have to turn over everything. So all of this is out in the public sector. So I wanted to look at that because of all those myriad of reasons that were out there. But here's the thing. Otis Tool, who was Henry Lee Lo- Lucas's partner in these crimes, lots of murders, but, you know, generally discounted because Texas, you know, when who was the epicenter with Henry Lee Lucas and Otis Tool had didn't were unable to check all of those so they put hundreds of homicides onto them so you throw the baby out with the bathwater and then it gets lost okay same thing with gsr same thing with uh, gunshot residue same thing with bite mark evidence just throw it all out that's sort of and i'm like you can't do that okay so back to our case in point Otis tool says i killed and did this with a bayonet and and adam walsh was if to refresh everybody or to let everybody know he's beheaded they found his head at the end of it and he removed his severed his head with a bayonet well a bayonet is a a plunging implement that doesn't make any sense but you would know that if you cut a lead out to somebody to do that well except for it wasn't a bayonet it was a senegalese knife like a machete and it's in a green sheath so i can see Otis tool thinking he would call it colloquially a bayonet and they walk that back of course that piece of evidence is lost to time that's what happens these multiple agencies but it's the same sort of small machete that Quint kind of holds over his head. Well, armed with that, he'd say, look, it's very heavy on the front. He describes that. It's lost. Forget it. You're going to cut. I mean, maybe you can write it down and send a picture to him. Certainly couldn't do it 30 years ago and send that out there. And, and you know, maybe you're going to have a good uh, tech. And I'm, I'm sorry, a detective out there can comprehend that. But, man, it's better to have that for the cost of a plane ticket, you know, in a hotel room or something. You're going to get that, you know memorialized forever and they're going to make an assessment based on that coming out of it but how are you going to transmit all of that tidbit of information if you don't do it you got bad you know data and a bad interview for the rest of perpetuity you know it's it's lost so that's my point about how how concise that stuff has to be and i never liked that in the in the fbi those cutting of leads and we work as yes we work as a team of course we do you know you have to do those things overseas it doesn't make sense but man you it's totally lost to it and pds do that they do it all the time they they work you know and they go out they mesh up with it and it's instantaneous you know you have somebody coming in they're your honored guest you go out and you interview them and it's a bad guy and that's how joe simpson was was captured down there uh an mbac case from um i'm sorry was it not Schulmeyer or was it Crystal Bislanowicz, I forgot. Crystal, correct? Yeah, Crystal Bislanowicz. Yeah. yeah, but that handoff happens, you know, seamlessly. It's just automatically done, right? Yeah, yeah. What, and what Tom's saying, uh, Jared, if I could just add on to that for a second. You know, at NCIS, the exact same thing. We had to send investigative leads, you know, and particularly with the military envir- environment, these guys are training, right? And they're all over the world, so you have to send it to another office and things get lost. I will say this, you know, and it's in the book, is when we created our cold case squad at NCIS, you know, we got a certain number of agents, right? A handful of agents. And so they did all the leads on all the cold cases. So at least there was synergy, right, from that dozen or so agents. And we, I think we actually had up to about 20. And so now it is a cold case investigator at least going to do the cold case instead of just, and, and what you yeah, lose is better. corporate knowledge, right? When we are, you know, like, Tom and I, over the years, what we would do is send a lead. Now the corporate knowledge is going. They don't have that at the other office. I'll give you just a quick case. It was the missing McLaughlin case out of out of South Carolina. A, a, real, a real heinous crime. I mean, five guys sit down on 30 January of 92 and decide to go kidnap a girl, rape her, and kill her. And that's exactly what they did. They all five flee to different areas of the country, right? And we very quickly, you know, get our hands on four of the five. And some of them confess, some of them don't. And we're doing exactly what Tom said. We're shooting investigative leads and we're following it up with phone calls. Hell, that was back in the day with a bag phone, right? I can remember in North Charleston Police Department having this big bag phone to call our office in Detroit to say, hey, we think he's coming there, right? And so to his, I just want to kind of add to what Tom was saying, that with cold cases, you'll see, I think a lot of people understand that 
cold case investigators do all the leads. And that's that's good that they do that, right? Good. They're not farming them out because we don't lose that corporate knowledge. That's good. Yeah, almost a common operating picture. How about to use a little military or intelligence community parlance so you have that baseline of knowledge that's right there. And so, yeah, who can fault that? It's the best, best practice, man. That's, that's coming out there. I, I had a thought while that happened. I, may, I imagine that. But so going across the country, we have a ME system, right? We have a yeah. coroner system in some other places. You have a crime scene unit in name, and then you go out and, and they're different. And some of them are on par with the detectives. And, and, and like you said, some, some are not and everything else. But I, I heard a great line from uh, a podcast I listened to, to emergency services. And the reason I, I came up with that is we would get into these hospitals to try to understand where our patient goes to. And the other part of it is we would have an injured person or a potential injury of one of our crime scene workers. How do we get that person the best care possible? So in doing the research on that, I, I love the line from it because things have emerged over time. And they said, if you've seen one medical services system, you've seen one medical services system. So stealing that, if you've seen one forensic unit, you've seen one forensic unit. Yeah. You just don't know. Did they have an back? Yes or no. That, and I put that as the gold standard up here. Do they have Niven? Do they, do they have, can they explain to you how they're taking and getting those tell, uh, shell casings, shell cases viewed? Or, or do they look at you and go, huh? Or, or we just send it to, you know, and man, you know, you just don't know what you get on the other side. There should be a standard because across the country, there's a standard for, you know, you can't just open a door and say, hey, I'm a uh, pediatrician. <laughs> You know, and yeah, you got to have some standards. So we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. Yeah. Uh, I think us types tend to look at things critically and that comes across as negative. But these discussions are, are, are good. They're intense. They're, they're sometimes critical. But that's how we boil out the best practices and how we make each other better, you know, and, and putting feelings aside and stuff like that. So that's what makes for really good solutions. And people go, oh, I never knew. Yeah, well, I think that brings us right back. I'm sorry. Go, go, ahead, go ahead, Joe. No, I was just going to say, you know, the capabilities vary. You know, if you have major, if you have a major metropolitan police department or sheriff's office, you know, a lot of that capability exists. You know, whether they've got an MVAC or they have Niven terminal, or you know, or working on down, do they have their own DNA lab? Like, you know, I'll take Charlotte Mecklenburg here in North Carolina. They have their own DNA lab capability. But then you get out in some of the rural areas. Guess what? I mean, they have nothing. Right. So they're relying, you know, just just in my state, some of the smaller police departments and sheriff's offices, they're having to drive shell casings, sometimes 30, 40, 50 minutes away to have a larger office, you know, make those entries. And, you know, I, I don't know. I know ATF's tried to get some mobile Niben vans out to you know, address some of that in, in some states. And I think uh, I think we've done that here uh, once or twice. But, you know, the capability is is always what what is a person's capability because that's that makes the difference of whether cases get solved or not and and I will tell you this that you can see that in unsolved cases right and it's it's not i mean and it runs the gamut i mean you have you may have a fully staffed great forensic unit you know department that's you know big with money and they still got unsolved cases right and then you may have this small little department with no resources and they've got an unsolved case so it it really you know there's no no reason. I mean, when you try to drill down why this case go cold, a lot of a lot of cases, a lot of different reasons. But I will say that you see fewer cold cases in areas where they have dedicated forensic support, and 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 what I refer to as is great crime scene investigators, right? Folks that are trained, folks that have education, right? Masters in forensic, you know, they're just better at doing the job, and they're going to find the evidence. They're going to take the time. You know, if I had my way, Jared, not just because it's your machine, but I would say, hey, every department should have a damn impact, right? Every department should have a naive internal, but that's just not reality, right? But I, I think- Oh, come on now, Joel. That well, should be reality. I mean, it should be because when you think of, you know, the amount of money that is spent, that is spent on other police functions, right? And I think you'll see that a lot of times that, and I don't know, Tom may not agree with this, but what I see- is some departments do not invest in forensic capabilities, right? They, they dedicate money to other locations. Yeah. And right now we're struggling. And one of the problems that is even exacerbating this is, is that we're struggling with getting folks to even want to come into the career anymore. So we actually have departments yeah. here in North Carolina, some of the larger departments, they are so decimated with manpower that they're having to take some of their detectives and actually have them 
perform road functions or patrol functions, you know, to just be able to cover the staffing requirements, right, of, of responding to current crime. And so and, and that's not that uncommon. I don't, I mean, not only here in North Carolina, but in other Southern states, you'll see it's, it's really hard to, to get qualified folks. And we're even dropping the level, right, of, of requirements and, and backgrounds of people. And we still can't get people to come in the door. So there's some challenges that, uh, that we're going to have to work through as a, you know, yeah. as a profession uh, going forward for sure. And I'm like, I hope what, Tom, yeah, could it's, it's Tom's right with, if the sixties, um, if he was reading, there was a lot of passivity going on. That gives me hope, right? Because I hope at some point the pendulum is going to swing back to where we're going to start holding people accountable to. Oh, it has Don't forget to. one last thing, the prosecutors here too. I will tell you that if you look across the board, and you, you may get some phone calls from some prosecutor who gets mad at me saying this, but <laughs> they are risk averse. They are not prosecuting people the way they, they used to, and they don't want to, and, it's, and, 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 and I don't know why. I mean, I think that I've seen that a, a huge downturn in the last 10 years of cases. I, 10 years ago, a prosecutor would have rolled the dice. It's circumstantial. Let's do it. We think they did it. Let's roll the dice. Let's those prosecutors today, oh, no, no way I would try that case. So it's it's a lot of different things going on here that folks should be aware of. Yeah. And it, it's a, um, a golden moment here for forensics. So I can go online and see uh, jobs. They're trying to lateral transfer people and they're offering all sorts of bonuses, like you said. So I, I, I said I kind of quipped this one. So there's 300 agencies vying for one police officer. Contrarily, I spoke to a PD last week, medium-sized out there. They had 300 applicants for one forensic. Yeah, I, I'm stunned. 300 applicants, and you're not even getting that. You're gonna, <laughs> you're probably 300 cops down. It's just the way things are. Nobody wants to be on the blame line, and you know, as the adage goes, you can get somebody into combat once, once, because once they get shot or or they, you know, don't, the VA doesn't take care of them, or they're told they're gold brick, they're done. They're done. It's the ingratitude and everything else. And they're, they go to trial, you know, accused of this. So something has to stem this. And I think, I, I think we're starting to see shades of that coming in too. Because you have to. You have to protect the guys. Or they're not, they can't do anything. And what are we going to do? Just turn it over? The biggest bullies happen. And I said I, I work, hmm, I'd be careful here, Indian country. But that's what happens. And we saw that with the, the takeovers of the reservations. If you don't have some kind of oversight, you don't provide some kind of relief, the bullies take over. They take over and, and that's a small, you know, as, or take it as a nation. That's what happens when you don't, there's no rule of law. They, there's an agreement how to do business. They just take over. And eventually you're going to get an effect where, well, over history, vigilante crews take over or um, what happened out in Missouri that uh, Ken Mclemore, I'm trying to remember his name, where everybody shot the guy, you, you know, in broad daylight, I think is what it's called is the book. But a bunch of townsmen shot this guy and you see crazy stuff like that. And it, and now you've hit a really low tipping point. And I, I don't know if the country really needs to go there. We can we can fix this thing, get it on track, but it's going to take a little bit of clawing its way back to get the police protected. What I see, I see some kind of police protection act being passed where they're like, you can videotape all you want, but you're going to provide a buffer zone of 30 feet and you're going to stay back from that and let them do their work. You're not going to interfere in this and it's going to be, you know, somehow um, regulated. It's probably going to come from a Southern state. It's just, that's uh, just probably how I see it cutting edge. Um, yeah, boy, you know what? That, I mean, that's a rabbit hole that we can yeah, spend tell another you, hour yeah. and a half to talking about, but Joe, back to your book, man. There's one particular line that really caught my eye, especially uh, with as much as the MVAC's involved with DNA. It says, gumshoe work precedes DNA evidence. So why don't you explain that a little bit? Well, I think what uh, what I mean in that reference, Jared, is simply that, you know, way before DNA evolved, we had to be a gumshoe detective, right? And that, hey, how much tenacity do you have any how how much how persistent are you do you have common sense right and i think a lot of people don't realize that good detectives are gumshoes and part of that would be that that gumshoe should know everything they can about dna right not just the, not just have to rely on the forensics or the csis but gumshoe detectives you know how it is it's so difficult to uh, to, to know how to anything about death right i've been doing this many years and there's so many things I don't know because there's so many things to know about death investigation. 
But one thing is, before DNA ever came onto the scene, uh, you know, Tom mentioned Dave McCraney earlier when we were chatting before you went on, you know, as a retired FBI agent. And, and he worked on arguably one of the first DNA cases in the country there in Quantico. It's the Lindsey Scott case, if you Google it or research it. And, you know, before that, we, we paid a lot of attention to fingerprints. I will say that I see from my vantage point, Tom may disagree, is a lot of crime scene units, there's an over-reliance on DNA. In other words, if I get a smudged fingerprint, I still may be able to get some DNA out of that unidentifiable print that's smudged, right? Can't use it to identify anybody, but I still might be able to scratch some yeah. DNA out of it. And so that's what I mean by that is we should not totally rely on DNA. It is our best weapon, right? I think I think arguably anybody said it, it is the gold standard for any prosecutor today. The only thing that's equivalent to it would be a fingerprint. But that's what I mean by you, you can't just rely on the DNA. It should be... You know, it's like your most valuable player, there's no doubt, on your team. That DNA, if you get it, man, that's that's what we want. But don't stop your investigation, right, on the DNA. And don't think I'm only going to make this case from a DNA standpoint. What we want, what I like in cases, is exactly what the prosecutors are after. And that's I want. I want some DNA. I want some fingerprints. I want some good witness statements. And I want the person to confess or tell the truth as to what happened. And if you got all three of those, you're rarely ever going to lose a case. I can promise you that. And so that's what I mean by that is a gum, the gumshoe is lost. Here, here's what I mean, Jared. Um, the detectives today are extremely bright. They grew up in an internet digital world environment. I think they're smarter than the detectives of my generation. I really do. Because I think they have more knowledge or they have the ability to have more knowledge. What I think is lacking is sometimes the interpersonal skills. That they're so used to doing things that are technologically based, right? That they don't think about, hey, I got to be a gumshoe. Okay, I got to knock on one more door. I got to interview one more witness, right? I got to find one more piece of evidence. And that's what I mean by that. I don't mean to be too long-winded here, but uh, don't just rely on physical evidence to solve your cases. It's three things we got to find to solve them. And, and it should, that's how you should go out of the gate because you're going to see some people in this, in this era or, or there's an over-reliance on technology. Now, here's oh, yeah. now, now the irony of that is think about this. There's not an over-reliance on the MVAC. Oh, my God. Why are people not, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> it's total I mean, void. It's yeah. almost counterintuitive. It's like, wait a minute. We got this over-reliance on DNA, but when we have it, we don't even use the tools that are – that. that's where I'm trying to go with you. I want So yeah. a gumshoe, it, being the gumshoe, would, hey, I know about the MVAC. I know that that will help and gives me a better chance of finding DNA, right? That's what I'm – does that make sense? Oh yeah, hundred yeah, percent. No, no, right on the mark. Well, one of the yeah. one of the thing I want to um, throw out at you guys is, you know, something else that I I don't know, Joe, if you're familiar with the Maidenwater case that was solved here in Utah, where a woman out of Ohio was murdered, and her husband basically well cut off her hands, you know, so that she and then froze her in the freezer, wrapped her up in a sleeping bag and plastic and and um, a carpet. And drove her all the way out to Utah uh, and dumped her on the side of a, a road down there by Lake Powell, kind of out in the middle of the desert. Fortunately, a couple of guys found her, you know, within a few days. And but she was she was unidentified for 20 years. So Jane Doe. Well, once they finally and, and the way that she was identified is is what I really wanted to bring up for you guys, is that the the agency out here in Salt Lake decided, you know what, we got nothing to lose. This this poor woman's been unident unidentified for 20 years. So they posted a post-mortem picture of her. And again, because she was frozen, it was almost a perfect picture. And then within a week, and it's totally separate, but within a week, the agency in Youngstown, Ohio, that was responsible for this missing persons case, posted a picture of her on, on the internet saying, Hey, this woman is still missing. She's been gone 20 years. Has anyone seen her? Well, there was a, a web sleuth, you know, and a, and a crime sleuth out in California who happened to be doing enough research that saw both of these pictures. And she was, she identified something. I think it was like a mole that was kind of behind her ear. And she said, Hey, I think that's the same person. So here you have some lady that is completely just, you know, enjoys true crime, enjoys listening to shows like this. And we have a lot of amazing listeners that, you know, they, they pick up stuff like this all the time. 
Well, she's the one that, that phoned in the tip and said, Hey, I think this is your missing person, or this is your unidentified person. And so then she was actually the catalyst that linked up the two agencies, the, the Utah Bureau of Investigation, as well as the Youngstown PD, the two of them got together and wham, yep, that was her. They identified her. So, and then once, once she was actually identified, then they were able to get onto the DNA work, which they used the MVAC on to, to identify her killer. So, you know, the, just like that case, you, you have a, another element that I think is, is relevant to the modern day and the, the information era that we're in where you have a whole bunch of people out there that are doing research on these cases and they're not even law enforcement. They're not even involved in it. They're just interested in true crime, interested in cold cases and everything else. And that's an amazing resource that detectives can use if they have, and especially those that are um, humble enough to accept help from outside sources. Yeah, that's a, I mean, that is certainly a trend right now. I mean, in addition to web sleuths, just think of all the the three primary genetic genealogists that that you know have solved the most cases. All three of those women, right? Whether it's C.C. Moore or Colleen Fitzpatrick or Barbara Vinter, I mean, they're all using volunteers. Every one of them, right? And and a lot of those are non paid or non you know they're just hey helping me you know they're they're expanding the reach. But yeah, we I've seen more and more of that. Jared, where you're, you're seeing these civilians are coming forward. And I'm like you, I mean, you know, we almost, I'm sure people almost go, well, wow, the police took in 20 years, couldn't figure this out. And somebody jumps on a couple of websites and, you know, voila, or voila, here, here we got this, you know, figure out who this is. But I, I always encourage that, right? We get, we get emails, we get calls almost well, certainly weekly. It's almost feeling like daily from people wanting to volunteer. People say, hey, do we do this case? Or, hey, had we thought about this? And we certainly, we never, you know, say, hey, go away. We're always evaluate what they have. And in some of these tips and calls we've gotten, they have led to, you know, the identity of a victim or the identity of a suspect or, you know, similar to what you're sharing in the case you just shared. Yeah, I always liked uh, getting, so with ERT, we would bring people in who would work to other jobs and then they would come aboard and they're like, well, I never really worked any of this. I was, uh, you know, an artist or whatever. I'm like, I love them, you know, or just yeah. people who are, are readers and they bring so much to the equation and they walk over and go, I'm pretty sure, you know, I'm, I may be wrong. And I'm like, no, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> so yeah, those asymmetric thinkers are outside the box and they just come from a different world and they just come up with these solutions. And, and if they, if it's wrong, you, you know, you just, we go, let's work to disprove this theory and let's work to disprove it. And uh, that's fair. You know, that's fair how to do that. But um, a lot of times they're right. And they just like, who knew? Who knew? I, I think of an example. We were out looking for a some skeletal remains is south of a, a government enclave out in uh, south of Baltimore. I forgot which one it was. But there were these thick uh, thicket uh, of there were uh, thorns on this it was very springy. So I brought out a bunch of tools with a machete. I'm like, I'll hit on an angle over here. Anyway, we had a nurse on the team and she brought out a paramedical shear. So I'm sitting here getting stuck with these things, getting tangled up. And I look to my right and the team over there and she's got a paramedical shears and she's just cutting her way through with something that costs about four bucks, you know, and I'm like, learned behavior right there. So yeah. immediately we adapt those and yeah, yeah, big $4 and we got everybody equipped on that particular piece of it. So examples like that. And then I realized, wow, I don't know everything. And long before that, I realized I didn't know everything, but anytime I can bring a different tool into it and explain that, you know, and, and, and bring that in uh, out to the equation. Um, to me, that helps solve things. You know, that's their thing. That's they, they know that, or they have a reason for it. If we listen to them. Well, the, the other thing that's that I think is helping as well, Jared, is what you're doing. You know, similar, you, you've got a podcast, right? All Things Crime. Yeah. I, I think, you know, a lot of folks, if, if they, and you don't even know this, but, you know, we do classes out here and we say, hey, go to All Things Crime. Because I know you bring guests on that know what in the hell they're talking about, right? They, they got the mechanics down of how to investigate a homicide. They got knowledge that other people don't have. But think of the various podcasts going on around the country. You know, I mean, forget your MVAC. I applaud you for doing what you're doing because that, you know, that knowledge, you, not, not everybody knows it, right? I mean, you, you, there are certain things that we have to rely on other people. And I, I think that's another thing that's solving cases is true crime podcast. I mean, 
and then folks raising money like Season of Justice, right? That there are, you know, and the, a lot of crowdfunding yeah. going on, crowdsourcing. And, you know, I think these are tools. I don't think they're going to dissipate. I think they're going to become more important in the future because I think you're just going to have more of it, you know, as the technology can, it, it continues to advance. One thing that, that Craig Ackley and I are doing right now, and, and this is certainly, you know, Craig's developed a digital system for working cold cases. It's not mine, but he has given it to the, to the Carolinas Cold Case Coalition. He said, here, you can have it. And what we're trying to do is put some AI into it, right? And, and you think about, oh, wow, you know, now that's the next step of cold cases is can we put AI into this thing? So, and we're going to try to take a case that has been solved and see if the AI finds the right suspect. Now that sounds futuristic, doesn't it? But that no, no, I, I, I love it. We talked to uh, Vince Pancoke, so he was my training agent down in Miami, you know, a, a million years ago. But Vince, if the name sounds familiar, did the Anne Frank investigation. So I asked him. I said, "We're going at something a prohibition agent who was killed in 1930 in Source, a very smaller data group right there." I said, "How can we do the same thing?" My writing partner, by the way, is ATF retired guy Adam. Adam Price, we've been going at this thing for a number of years now. I said, how did you do that? And he says, well, it, it was just really cool how he did it. So he goes, you can only remember so much. And Vince just cuts to the chase. And he said, get all of that, get it translated. And then those keywords will be get pulled out of it. So I'm like, wow, it's that simple. So sure enough, when somebody makes mention of some name in it, there's name variants. You're like, well, hey, you know, for us who've worked this, we'll go, where do I know that name right. from? And you're flipping through it's right on there. It's right on there. And I was just like, that is so awesome. That is so awesome. He, and, and they took literally Joe and Jared, they, they took every interview with Otto Frank, with everybody who was affiliated or associated with the Frank investigation over the years and the different languages had it translated down. Now they had a, you know, a, a uh, juggernaut of, of, of resources to do that. I say that tongue in, somewhat tongue in cheek, but they had that ability and then a lot of people and making that database out of it. So when they had to translate it into a common language, they could bring that across for indexing. And, and I make mention of that too, because I tell them, I, I said, well, you go to trial, it's you, it's you. And in the federal system, it's you as being the assistant attorney on that case, second or third chair. I said, the defense has everything indexed. They have assistance, but you know, they're getting paid big dollars to do that. I said, let's borrow from that. And so that's exactly what Vince did and was successful on this. To, to flesh out all those other stray leads and then ultimately pointed to one person. So I was like, wow, wow, I have a long way to go, a lot to learn out here. So yeah, very impressive body of work is what he did. And yeah, I just learned a little bit of it. But yeah, that's interesting where we're going to be going on that here soon. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. AI is really going to be a game changer for cold cases. And it's just getting the right, you know, set of questions into it and, and you know, it seems so futuristic to me, but I realize, you know, like you, Tom, that, you know, what we learned and what we know, you know, is a small part of what a lot of people know. And, and so look for that, Jared, in the future. Uh, I'll keep you posted on, on that as to how oh, yeah. it's progressing as, as we use it. Well, guys, it's obviously we, we can talk about this stuff all day long. So I, I think we ought to wrap it up here. But, Joe, I want to I want to plug you a little bit. First of all, you know, in in addition to your expertise, you're you make yourself available, which is fantastic. You know, you're not just sitting back and you know being in retirement mode. So if anybody needs to talk to talk to Joe, go to Blue Line Training Group out of North Carolina. And I know I know Joe, you are all over the place, and you know how you how you ended up writing this book. I think is fantastic. Again, the book is called. Solving Cold Cases, Investigations, Techniques, and Protocol by Joe Kennedy with Hogan Hilling. So I'm going to hold this up again so that folks can see it. And, you know, definitely uh, get this book. And I, I'm, I'm going to, as soon as I get it, I think I get it tomorrow, which is ironic, but I am going to be pouring into that thing because, you know, even though I'm a civilian and I'm, I bring the M back to, to people, it still is there. People ask me a lot of questions, you know, they'll look at evidence and they'll say, well, is this appropriate for an MVAC or not? And uh, frankly, I need to know. So that's one of the first first things I'm going to be pouring into. All right. How, how about if I throw a data bit up here? You know, I, here's here's one that's cold case. 
the cousin wrote this 1963 homicide. Um, she was murdered out there. Somebody, you know, like you say, you're reviewing this. Somebody may recall or know something and you never know. Um, prime for that as well. But hey, what the heck? You know, if we, we capture it, we capture it and uh, could be another solve. That'd be a yeah. 63. And they still have the evidence, by the way, per the book. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Well, Joe. Yeah. Any, great. Great. Anything else, anything else you want to throw out at us? No, uh, Jared, I, I will, you know, I will say this. We look at a lot of cases. Uh, I think we lift, looked at just north of 200 cases last year at the Carolina School. We, we're willing to help anybody. We don't try to tell you how to do it. Call us. I'm up every morning about 4.30, 5 o'clock looking at cases or somewhere, you know, traveling. And, you know, our I'm like you said to start this show, have no hobbies other than a border collie, right? And really this is what we do, uh, kind of like Tom said, uh, we get bored doing something else, right, Tom? <laughs> so oh, man. It makes we, me feel alive. If we can help in any way, you know, give us a call, reach out to us a couple different ways, and, and we'll call you back or, or try to help you any way we can. I right, applaud right, you what you're doing, uh, Jerry. Keep doing it. You know, think of you probably never imagined doing a podcast when you first started, you know, working with the MVAC. Yeah, it solves cases. I'm, I'm, I will say this. You know, I know the city of Winston is now at least got it going. You've got several impacts here in the state. We're constantly telling people to try to impact their old evidence, right, if, if applicable. So I appreciate what you've done to, to, to make some really positive con contributions, you know, in the field. Yeah, well, Joe, I've known you a long time. What was it, eight years ago that we first met at yep. ASOC? Yeah. And, yeah, ever since then, I've just been just – huge fan. And, and I know that bringing together like minds and, and people that have expertise in different areas is absolutely the best way to do it. So Joe, I, I appreciate you coming on and Tom appreciate all your um, input. So guys, we can, you know, as, as your book goes along and you know, Joe, I think you ought to, you ought to get hot and start writing another one. Well, I, I tell you, Jerry, that's, that's probably something that won't happen. I'm just got too much else going to to write another book, but uh, hopefully this book, it is designed to help detectives, nothing more, nothing less. Uh, and it well, will appeal I, to true crime enthusiasts. So hopefully, hopefully some of your listeners, it'll help. The, the key is, you know, it's one thing to write, but can the book help you maybe solve a case? That's, that's the intention of it. Yeah. Well, it's, I, I'm sure it's absolutely packed with information, you know, just reading the, uh, the excerpts of it. It's, uh, I'm already excited about it. So, all right, gentlemen. All right. Thanks, and I uh, appreciate you coming on, and we'll talk at you later. Okay, thanks. Tom, take care. If I can ever do anything for you, please you let too. me know, sir. Same goes this way. Yeah, we'll uh, tighten that um, connections all up after this. Absolutely. Sounds good, Joe. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for joining us. Your attention today brings us one step closer to exposing and eliminating the evil that brings crime to our communities.